Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Performing Arts Frontiers. This is our afternoon program that's all about performing for video games through motion capture and voice acting. Um, just like in the morning, we're going to have a number of guests who are going to, uh, we're going to have talk, talkbacks and uh, roundtable discussions with them. Sorry, not a roundtable discussion. I'm still coming back from lunch. We're going to have a number of interviews with our guests this afternoon, so it'll be different than the morning. Uh, whereas we had presentations in the morning, these are going to be just straightforward talks and uh, discussions with the guests. Um, I'm going to ask questions that I have prepared for them, and you, the audience at home, can also write questions in the comments field on YouTube. Uh, and our lovely moderators will choose a few questions and send them to me to ask the guests. Uh, we're going to jump straight in in just a minute, uh, but there is one programming change. Those of you who looked at the program um, a few weeks ago or, or at the beginning of this week uh, may notice there's a difference. Uh, unfortunately, due to an unavoidable work conflict, Peter Gornstein, the director from Massive Entertainment, is not able to be with us today. So instead, we're extremely excited to welcome Agent 47, hitman himself, David Bateson, instead. So that was the trailer for Hitman 3, which was just released in January this year. And I'd like to welcome David Bateson. Uh, Dave? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's really exciting to have you here, and it's really exciting that uh, it's, it's an exciting time for Hitman because the, the, the sort of big trilogy has now completed. Yeah. It's been, uh, um, I think, was it 2015, 16? Mm -hmm. The start of the trilogy. But in a way, it's the same kind of search for his roots that's, that's been uh, haunting Agent 47 for, yeah. for 20 years now. But, uh, yeah. It was very satisfying to see it sort of come to fruition over, over three games. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned that it's been around for 20 years. Yeah. It's pretty unique in games to have a role that has lasted that long and to have one actor attached to it. Yeah, so I hear. <laughs> I think uh, that the actor, voice actor who plays Mario from Mario Brothers is the... <laughs> He beats me, but I, I'm, the, I'm the next one yeah. you know, for the longest running. But I think no one at the time was aware that it, it would be such a, uh, a, a big hit. Yeah. You know, the yeah. So, so I wanted to ask you about that because, because um, obviously, obviously 20, 20 years ago is sort of, that's before the time that working in games was glamorous. It wasn't, I, yeah. I think it's, nobody was sort of saying like, oh, I want to be a video games actor with my career. So how did you wind up 
doing the first one. Well, yeah, I'd love to say it was an audition with 3,000 other actors and it was, you fought to the death in the yeah. arena. <laughs> but no, I was sort of in the right place at the right time uh, in the sense that I was, um, circumstances led me to Denmark uh, as, a, as a English speaking actor, which is weird to begin with. Yeah. And then I decided to stay. Um, uh, but I was in a, in a studio doing a voiceover and at the same studio they were um, doing the computer graphics for the first game. Um, and they actually interrupted the, the voiceover session and came and said, David, when you're finished, uh, you know, could you come and have a look at the graphics? And we're looking for a voice. And went, yeah. okay, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Imagine if I said, no, I'm not doing it. I'm much, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, don't even go there. But the point is, it was still an audition, mm -hmm. um, uh, but there was kind of no pressure because yeah. no one knew. I mean, I mean, it literally kind of dawned on them, oh, shit, we need a voice for this guy. <laughs> Oh yeah, well, why didn't I think of that? Yeah. So um, uh, it was an audition and, and they just, you know, I, I had to choose a, a, a way of doing it. Um, there was no one, you know, it was just a, almost like a self tape. I just looked at him and, okay, I'll do it like this. Yeah. And the other thing was I thought, it says he's a silent assassin. Well, that's, that kind of makes me unemployed. Yeah. <laughs> what do I do? Go, ugh. Yeah. You know. And um, so the, uh, but you know, so there wasn't not much to say in, in, the, in the first games, mm. but they liked what they they heard, and, and here I am, yeah. 21 years later. And, and so, was the first job, job was it more of those sort of just grunty sounds and that kind of thing? <laughs> to, <laughs> to, 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 to an, an extent, extent, it was. Yeah, the, the voiceovers voice were, were, were quite sexy, sexy anyway. <laughs> <laughs> People being, oh, oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what exactly are you doing? None of your business. I'm killing people. Yeah. Um, but um, no, uh, <laughs> it makes me laugh thinking yeah. about it. Um, but no, there, there was there was dialogue, but it was um, it was minimal. And uh, in fact, the um, the person, the first actress who played my boss, mm. Diana Burnwood, uh, was my theatre boss, Vivian McKee. Oh, yeah. And she many times said to me, I do all the talking and you get all the credit. I went, that's Hollywood. <laughs> so, she killed me. Yeah. But um, such is life. But it, it changed and evolved um, in line with technology and, uh, evolution. Yeah. And uh, it, it, in fact, two games ago, Hitman, I noticed in hit, what they call Hitman 1, 2 and 3, the last three games. Yeah. But in Hitman 2, they actually said to me, I noticed that, I thought, wait, he's doing a lot of, like, a lot more talk, a lot more sort of superficial stuff, where he's in disguise as a waiter or something, and he's walking around schmoozing at the Paris fashion show, and going, would you like uh, another, <laughs> more ice in your gin and tonic? I'm going, this is not Hitman. What's, what's the ice and the tonic crap, you know? Yeah. And there was a lot of that kind of um, reactions with the, um, uh, to, you know, uh, every other character going on, uh, you know. And I said, uh, what happened to the silent assassin? What's, he's got verbal diarrhea here, you know? And they said, no, go with us because technology has moved on so much now. And there are long sequences where the player uh, is in disguise as you and, and is, is work in the room yeah. to f pick up the clues. And it's not just go up and go, Doof, yeah. you know? um, and it makes the player, it'll make the player feel more involved mm. in the game. Mm. Okay, oh, I don't like it. I don't <laughs> think this is a bad idea. But of course they were right. Yeah. Um, and that was because of technology uh, yeah. evolution. It was much more complex now to, to get through a level and, yeah. and, and take out your target. So that made the player feel more uh, interactive. Mm. Did, did that, that change, change your conception, conception of the character at all? Because obviously if he's a, did you have to adjust it? Because he, if he's a silent killer, that says one thing about him. Maybe he, he you know, what are his social skills? And did, did, was that a new thing that you had to think about? Because now he's quite savvy if he can talk to everyone and knows how to blend in. Well, yeah, I will say there was a funny thing happened at the Paris Game Show, which really surprised me because I know Agent 47 extremely well. I mean, dare I say this out loud, but he's a friend of mine. Uh, I really know him, and I look forward to when we do a recording session, uh, which just lasts for a game, four to six months, because we, you know, we level at a time every month to six weeks, and then there are retakes, and then there's the next level, and so on. So I'm with him, real up close and personal, for about a six-month period yeah. for every game. And I, <laughs> when we did Hitman One, when he was at the 
Paris game sh uh, fashion show, and he's backstage, and, he, and he's disguised as some kind of a fashion wannabe, you know. <laughs> and he gets approached by a very flamboyant sort of makeup designer, going, "Hi, and who are you, Monsieur? Is this?" And I suddenly I just looked at him, going, uh, oh, "No information in this area. Should I kill him? No, <laughs> no, bad idea. There's a lot of models around." Yeah. Okay, but <laughs> suddenly I realized he was not, he wasn't homophobic, but he was like, ah, yeah. I've never dealt with this before. Yeah. You know, I'm normally dealing with a, you know, a hatchet man or a guard or a, yeah. and yeah. I love that. There's suddenly this reality crossed, crossed into the game and it became, his level of interaction became much more genuinely real. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that, that, uh, that and the fact that the writers and myself have basically grown up. Uh, over the years, so I don't know. It's a chicken and egg situation, you know. Mm. Do they write dialogue which they can hear me say yeah. and go, "Oh, he could get that. He could get the double meaning, uh, it's, you know, a little bit of innuendo or, or dryness or evilness, uh, or is it me? You know, uh, so am I influencing them as a personality, or have they now been influenced by the by the character so much that they just write the dialogue? Yeah, yeah. but it's. Um, it's a, a wonderful process, anyway, and yeah. very rare yeah. to have that kind of luxury yeah. over 20 years. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's great. It's, it's um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like you said, very rare to have that, that sort of flow back and forth between between the team and the actor. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, so, so it started in in, in 2000. Um, yeah. Was it recording in 2000, or was did you record in the no, early 90s? Uh, no, we recorded actually the year before, okay. 1999. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh. Oh, the passage of time. Yes, I know. I was four years old. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. Sorry. Um, so yeah, we recorded uh, 1999. Okay. So, so the first time it was sort of like you fell into it, and then you just sort of yeah. did the job, and then. Um, can you talk about how, how things developed from there? Like when, I assume when you did the first one, you probably didn't know it was, I obviously didn't know you'd be standing here today talking about it, but like, yeah. how, 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 how did it develop and what kept you coming back? The money. Yeah. <laughs> no. Even at the beginning? No, no, the no, money was pretty negligible <laughs> at the beginning. Um, no, um, just as, as an actor, um, we're normally as an actor, you're attached to something for anything from two months to three months, maybe maybe four if it's a really long film shoot, but mm -hmm. max. Um, so you just don't get it, you know, everything changes. Yeah. And I, sometimes towards the end of a theater run or a film shoot, you look back at the character and go, oh, I'm just getting it now. Yeah. Oh, it's the rap party, damn, yeah. you know. Can we shoot it again? You know, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no problem, just write a big check. But um, so it, you get attached to that, the character you're playing mm. and, um, and feel quite protective towards them. Yeah. I do, anyway. But um, I, I think actors or creative people do. Um, so I was genuinely intrigued that this thing really began to get a momentum of, uh, all of its own, uh, which I will also say, I think it surprised the, uh, the initial sort of you know, IO Interactive people going, what mm. the hell happened? You know? Yeah. <laughs> We're in a building with 200 employees. What? That's not supposed to happen. Yeah. You know? um, so, and, and that being, that attachment, so I, I was just generally open. I would, I would never have said, no, I don't want to do that again. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a no brainer. And did that, did that come after the second game? Or when, when did the sort of moment, when did you feel like there was momentum picking up behind it? Well, the, the first, first one, one, as I recall, didn't sell that fantastically well, but it got exceptional reviews. Okay. And then they go, well, what do we do with that? Well, the, the, our peers are telling us this is the shit, mm. but it's not selling it. We haven't got a, a yacht in, in Tobago yet, you know, yeah. or, or, you know, what the hell? Um, but they, I think they had a good thing. They've got a lot of money offshore. They had yeah, they've got it. Clear goals. Oh, oh, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. No, um, they. So the, already after the first game, when the reviews came in, they, they knew it was something very strong, mm. as I recall. Mm. Um, I think the 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 real snowball was um, the reaction to the second game, and then the third game was just like, you know, <laughs> you know yeah. um, but nothing is can be taken for granted. You no. know. There's, and also because of the, the gaming industry, as you said, referred to earlier, it was like, 
what is it? You know, we've got uh, we've got Mario Brothers. You know, what is there? The Pac Man? Oh shit! You know, the everything was snowballing. Everyone was yeah. discovering the industry mm. from from the ground up mm. together. Yeah. So there was this race. I remember once when they there was a six year break when. Um, from blood money to um, to absolution, mm -hmm. and that six years is a millennium yeah. in in uh, in involvement of technology. Mm -hmm. They had to simply start start again with a new engine, yeah. because it was uh, it was old fashioned. You know, it was you know it, it wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't have worked. Yeah, uh, and and you don't get any thanks from the players because they expect it. Yeah, which I find. Almost rude, you know. In this, you know, seriously, I, I think. Shouldn't you say, "Wow, the graphics were amazing"? They go, yeah. "No, we're the about bloody time," you know. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. they just expect it to be uh, to go up a notch, and everyone I interact with is going, you know. <laughs> <laughs> "That nearly killed me that one." You know? <laughs> so um, there's no thanks, but it's a kind of a, a you know a wheel that you run on yeah. from the get go. Yeah. yeah. And, and that, that, that kind of ties into the, the sort of broader theme, theme of today, you know, of, of digital performance and, and motion capture. So you, yeah. I, I, I'm assuming you, there was no motion capture in the first games. So can, no. you, can you talk about, because you, you said, you, you know, you feel quite a lot of ownership over Agent 47. Like, you feel like you know him. He's your guy. Yeah. So what was it like when they started doing motion capture and suddenly you had to share him with other actors? Or, or like, did, well, did you feel, experience it that way? Yeah, or? I, I got a call <coughs> from a friend of mine, Bo Thomas, mm -hmm. who was, uh, Actor stuntman mm -hmm. in Denmark, yeah. and he's the same build as me and stuff. He said, "Hey, Dave, I'm playing you." I went, oh. "No, you're not." He said, "Yes, I am. <laughs> I slip into you every day by motion capture." Went, we need to talk. But um, uh, but he, uh, so he, so it was nice to know that someone I, I you know, a good friend of mine, mm -hmm. was was me. Mm -hmm. You know, because I, yeah. I, I, as I said, I was feeling kind of protective about. Yeah. He's mine. Yeah. Um, so that helped, uh, and I, I kept asking them when this, this motion cap industry started expanding. And I, I know it, in later years, when they moved to their latest offices, the whole top floor is, is a massive green ca uh, green screen motion cap studio. Yeah. And I was going, "Oh, this is where the game. Oh, let me play." Yeah, you know. And they're going, "No, <laughs> get out the room." No. Um, the only closest I've come to it was with is what they call performance capture. Yeah, sure. It's just yeah. all my facial stuff that's me okay cool when, when, when did when did they bring in I, I assume you're, you're live capturing your face while you're reading the, the lines is that right or yeah, yeah. Both, both both that, that. Um, uh, but also just uh, you go through a series of expressions you know yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> just, you know, yeah. it seems really weird you know but I, I did get very that was for I think it was absolution it was after mm. blood money yeah when they started the whole new engine and okay. technology took a quantum leap. Um, that's from, as far as I recall. Uh, and that was spooky yeah. because you could see it yeah. um, straight away. You go, oh my goodness, I, I do that with my eyes. It's me. Yeah. You know? yeah. and, uh, and, and then some of the, the word stuff. But mm. not normally now. It was just uh, I'd record separately okay. and the performance capture um, you know, algorithms are, are attached. Yeah. So, okay, okay. So, 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 so then a lot, lot of the facial, facial stuff that you do is, is you just, you put in sort of base expressions and things and then they take it into animation land and, and yeah. apply stuff to it and uh, just blend between them. And we, we did try, try it out. out. Okay. Um, but but they, they, to be, be honest, honest, at that, that time, time they didn't have the technology. technology. Yeah. And and I'll, I'll give you a simple example. example. They, they didn't, didn't have a hands-free setup. So they had a guy who was like, uh, you know, the, the runner or whatever it was, that expression, it doesn't matter. But, you know, he was literally moving the cables so I could move around and stuff yeah. like that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. And I go, oh, this is not going to work because yeah. the, the, the microphone wasn't up to scratch. So sure. Yeah. Just said, stand still and say your lines. Yeah. You know. Okay. But, yeah, I wish we'd done more of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, going back to, to Absolution, uh, the yeah. sort of development of the, the industry, that's the game uh, you were famously almost replaced as Agent 47. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, can, can you talk about that? Because and the yes, I can. Because yeah. I'm not under contract now. <laughs> <laughs> I had to be a bit discreet at the time. Did you? Okay. I had a big did, NDA yeah. on it. Yeah. They, I don't think, inter, uh, to be honest, I Interactive will ever publicly admit it, mm -hmm. and that's okay. We're still friends. Okay. But um, they, so I got the word that they were. We've decided to go in a new direction. Mm -hmm. But um, unfortunately, I heard it in a weird way when they'd already showed the. Uh, 
the one and a half minute trailer uh, at the E3 that year. Mm -hmm. And uh, my phone just melted, mm -hmm. just lit up. And I went, what's going on? Yeah. Everyone's, all these people saying, you know, hey, have we, you're not the voice? What's going? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, uh, because at that point I'd been doing it for 11 years. Yeah. And we'd already talked about that I was going to be the, you know, we start soon. And, and then, oh, must be the delay with the new engine. And then suddenly, boom. Mm -hmm. Um, but then, uh, the fans, I have to say, the fans were a distant thing for me, mm -hmm. um, way back mm -hmm. when, you were going, who are these people? Yeah. But they collectively started an online thing saying, we're not going to buy the, uh, pre-order the game mm -hmm. if David doesn't play Hitman. <laughs> and they went from February, April, March, April, May, got to like the end of May. And I got this very nervous phone call from iodractive going, hi, hi. Okay, I thought you were dead. You know? no. And they said, they wouldn't even tell me on the phone. They said, listen, we want to um, talk to you about working on another project. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, I'll come by the office. No, 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 no. Um, can we meet off, off we site? They <laughs> went, okay. You wear a trench coat. Yeah, no, so we, we met in a tiny little cafe with about 10 people here. Yeah. What are we doing here? <laughs> Got to read, read this disclaimer and, and sign that NDA. I went, yeah. massive thing. Mm. And I signed it, and then they pulled, pushed the script across. I went, wait a minute, this is Hitman. Yeah, yeah but no, now you can't say anything. <laughs> but they, to their absolute credit, mm. IO Interactive actually went behind the backs of the Square, Square Enix that owned them at the time mm -hmm. and realized that they were on the Titanic going, shit, no one's buying the game. Yeah. And they recorded it. Uh, totally undercover really? uh, in a studio and then just flew over to Montreal and went, there you go, what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> Be honest. Uh, that could have gone really bad for them because yeah. they went against the, you know, the, the, their boss's uh, thing and then yeah. the boss went, actually, yeah, so go with the bald guy. You know. Yeah, yeah. Lucky yeah. them. But thanks to the fan. That's amazing. And IRO, IRO having the balls to do it. Yeah. I mean, talk about, about um, you know, you're always looking for some sort of like, a, as an artist, you're always looking to know that people like your work and, and that it's being appreciated. <laughs> I think that there's probably no better indication that people like it than, than something well, like that. Well, I have to say that was the, the line in the sand for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything after that, I went, I need to really pay attention to these amazing fans. Yeah. And if there's any opportunity I can have to meet them or show up at an mm -hmm. event or, a, you know, a, Mm -hmm. a comic con or a gaming conference or yeah. I, I want to do that yeah. um, and and that was really exceptional mm -hmm. I'll, I'll never forget the EGX in 2015 <laughs> they put in a half an hour meet and greet at the end of the day in a hall which is like you know insanely huge um, and uh, they went oh it's just half an hour okay we got the, got the stuff let's get into character and there was this guy went whoa that's like the 10 deep and it goes run. And anyway, the security came at uh, quarter to six when it was closing and they went, listen, here are the keys. We're going home now. You're in the corner of the whole place. We've locked off the area. But, and I was pleased, obviously for IO Interactive's sake, but also at that point Square Enix was still involved yeah. because they were all there, all these suits mm. and geez, what the hell? We can't send these fans away. There'll be a riot. You yeah. know, they've been standing here for, that went until quarter to eight in the evening, where you're going, ah, yeah. <laughs> 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 your, your name? <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. You know, and that was deeply humbling. Yeah. Uh, but I swore then, I, before that, you know, I, would, I would always be there uh, for them. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I've got them to thank in more ways than one. Yeah. That's, 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 that's such an amazing, amazing story, story because the, 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 I mean, the video game industry is sort of famously brutal in a way, in general, yeah. and then yeah. actors, especially, you know, we're sort of, you know, often, you know, you sort of, um, you call in three days before and with a lot of jobs, you know, you get called in at the last minute, they give you a thing, you know, they're sort of like, you're, you're sort of, they're like, come on, just come in, do the job, get out. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's amazing, uh, it's what's really amazing about that is that it, it it came organically from there was no you didn't have the hype of the studio being like here's David Bates in Agent Forty Seven so that's a yeah, yeah. I, I mean you know in real terms I'm I'm unknown yeah. Um, yeah. which personally I like a lot yeah. um, but 
you know, like, <laughs> we all like more work, but uh, don't want to be too unknown. Yeah, yeah. But you know what I mean? I, I, I actually get real panicked if I was being, you know, that's David B. Yeah. Adam. You know, <laughs> shit. You know, um, I experienced that as a, as a young actor, and I didn't like it, uh, yeah. being really known. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Really didn't like it. Yeah. No, I can understand that. Um, I have, so I have one last question for you because we're about to wrap up. Yep. Um, just about the fans in general, you were saying that you, um, you were talking in the break actually that you, you get lots of requests from people about doing, you know, people asking you for things and some, sometimes it's something very moving, sometimes it's uh, kind of crazy. Um, and I guess I, I, I was going to ask at what point your career hit that level, but I, I'm guessing it sort of comes along with that moment. But how, yeah. just in general, how did you, because there's one, it's one thing to be in a room with, you know, a thousand people there waiting to sign your, waiting for a signature and be like, okay, wow. But then yeah. that's something, the, these requests, it's something different. That's, that's personal interactions and, and like coming into people's lives. So how's that yeah. been for you and, and how do you manage that? And Well, I, I, as I say, I, I just want to be there yeah. for the fans because of their, their fanaticism and, and loyalty to the franchise. And, yeah. um, you know, I, 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 to be honest, I don't. To be honest, I don't want to talk about what's just just happened, but um, I was approached from someone who had a bereavement mm. and uh, who'd asked me to sort of say a few words, mm. um, both in character and also as, as me. And, mm. and I, I was, I cried. You yeah. know, I just was so blown away by that because it, it generally had an effect on a family. Uh, who reached out because mm. um, it was important to that mm. uh, that, that person. Mm. But um, I, I will happily, uh, <laughs> you know, and I have had that. You know, I've had a guy call me in the office. Hey, would you please send me a message to my girlfriend so I can have the tattoo on the back of my head? <laughs> and I went, I'm with you, man. I'm with you. So I actually video message saying, listen, you know, Cherise, yeah. just yes. give him. <laughs> and then I got this. He sent me a photograph. At the back of his head, and this girl, you know, hold, looking at the camera, with her really not happy. <laughs> it's important to get this. Um, but uh, other things, I, I've done wedding wedding proposals, mm. you know, yeah. uh, uh, and all sorts of kind of crazy greetings. And I think that's fun. It's just part of the the industry now, which again did not exist yeah. uh, years ago. I, I'm scared to think what what's down the line. If we yeah. all do, you know. Holograms, you know, hi, yeah. I'll be there forever, you know. <laughs> so, but, yeah, and it all started with you in a studio and someone just saying, hey, David, come in this room for a second. Yeah, yeah. and don't, don't say, say no, go away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That wraps up our time. Cool. cool. Thank you so much for joining us, David. It's been a pleasure talking to you. My pleasure. Yeah, good.
Ophelia is our main character, she's the player character, and she is sort of a veteran of the Adeptus Sororitas. What I write on the page doesn't really come to life until an actor gets it in their hands and, and they do their sort of take on it and their performance. All the actors totally committed to, to those characters. It's um, always interesting to see the little idiosyncrasies that they bring to the performance, which normally would take, as an animator, would take me days to do and they can just do it. These performers have got these little white optical trackers on their faces which are recorded by um, cameras mounted on their heads. That goes through this pipeline and it eventually ends up in, a, in our editor. This means that we can take all, all of this nuanced expression and put it into a much, much smaller file. Yeah, good. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Our next guest is Jessica Jeffries, who is a casting director uh, for special effects and VFX uh, based in the UK. Uh, Jessica, thank you so much for joining us. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, wonderful to see you here. Um, where are you joining us from? Um, right now, I'm in Bristol at my husband's parents' house so that they can help babysitting. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Thank you to your grandparents or to your uh, your, your parents-in-law then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so we have. Um, I'll just explain quickly that uh, uh, Jessica can't see me on the the screen. Um, so yeah, if something seems a bit funny, that could be an explanation or not. <laughs> uh, but. Um, so we just saw a, a, a video, it was a behind the scenes for a, a, a Warhammer 40k job that you worked on. Do you want to say just a little bit about that project and, and your involvement? quickly yeah that project um was actually one of the first ones that we um cast it and shot during lockdown ah. in 2020 mm -hmm. and so what was amazing about it was it was the first sort of big project that i worked on where we really had to look at all of the covid and safety guidelines and things like that and also really pare down the cast so mm. we had um we we had only two actors in covering all of the body capture for the roles um and they also then voiced um roles themselves and then everyone else was just vo separately hmm. um so yeah it was i mean it was great i know that there were challenges in terms of making sure that everyone on set was socially distanced and stuff like that but all ties into how brilliant motion capture is where you can just pop people next to each other in post. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And w when, when, when was that shot last year, if you're allowed to say? Uh, June, I believe, June, June 2020. So, so the, the turnaround on that was so quick Yeah. from shoot to release. Yeah. It was the quickest I've ever been a part of. Yeah, and it was the early days of the pandemic as well. So I, I guess you were, yeah, you, you must have been just flying by the seat of your pants trying to figure it out as you go along, basically. Yeah, everything was different. You know, such a um, it, it's such a known universe, mm. the world of Warhammer. Mm. And so finding actors, you're already working amongst NDAs anyway, and then yeah. suddenly you're doing everything over Zoom rather than face-to-face -face and trying to get someone's entire physicality, trying to get them to both embody and vocally sit with a character all mm. over Zoom while they're in their bedroom and you're in your little <laughs> front room. It's it threw up so many new challenges. Yeah. Um, but our cast absolutely shone from audition through to the actual shoot, and it was it was amazing. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so that's what you're doing now. Uh, can you go, sort of go back go back a bit in time and, and tell us about your journey into motion capture? Um, I, I, you started as a performer and now you've moved into casting. Um, yeah, can you just tell us about sort of how you started out and then how that transition happened? Yeah, I uh, so I uh, went to drama school in East London. I went to East 15 acting school and I specialized in acting and stage combat. So mm -hmm. it was a very physical degree. And then coming out of that, I managed to land a job doing motion capture for a video game. Um, I'd never really heard of it before. I didn't really know anything about it. Mm. And of course, day one on set, and I was like, 
this is what I want to be doing. Um, and that was on a game called Until Dawn, which I ended up working on for the, over three years. Oh, wow. Um, so, so just quickly, what, what year did that start in? The shoot? 2010. Okay. So that's so yeah, 2010 was when I started in motion capture. Mm. And then in about 2018, after doing so many wonderful, wonderful jobs and sort of being a jobbing motion capture actor, um, working with this, you know, amazing actor called Alex Lehman as well on a shoot. <laughs> um, I decided I wanted new challenges, but I still loved the industry, but I just I felt like I'd got everything out of it as a performer that I could and mm. that um, there was stuff in the industry that I wanted to change mm. and I wanted to put myself in a position to be able to make those positive changes for mm. the industry and for actors within um, performance capture as well. So there were no casting directors freelancing really in the UK specializing in this area of the industry mm. and so many video game developers were just going through the studios not doing proper casting process and that kind of thing so I'm sort of made up a job for myself and told everyone I was doing it and luckily got some work yeah <laughs> kind of <laughs> yeah and that's amazing. And obviously, you were you were kind of in a unique position to to take that role on because you you had all the experience of the industry. You'd worked on. I, I I know you. I don't know all the games that you worked on, but you worked on a ton of really big games. You worked in all the big studios, so you really mm -hmm. knew the industry inside and out. And um, there's probably not many people that could have actually just gone out and been like, "Oh, I'm going to start casting for this now." Um, so yeah, yeah. there's a kind of there's a there's a real cockiness that went along with it. <laughs> I was like. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think well, it's I've been an actor for nearly 10 years you know mm. I'd, I'd been in action rooms for theatre film tv you know I'd done that I knew how castings worked um, and I knew how I wanted to behave as a casting director mm -hmm. but more importantly I knew the side I knew I knew how to talk to game developers how to talk to studios mm. what it took what it takes to be a performance capture actor mm. um so I was able to blend sort of that knowledge together and and yeah and, and, and work with studios in a new way. Yeah, that's awesome. And so coming coming out of that experience of working as a as an actor, and then you, you said that there were a lot of things about the industry you wanted to change. Uh, what mm -hmm. were those things? Um, it, it's a, it's a bit of a wild west. Um, the motion capture and performance capture industry. Um, it still is across Europe and the UK, where a lot there's there's not proper um, casting processes, mm. and there's often um, incorrect contracting of actors. Um, actors can be underpaid; they can be not treated how they should on set. I don't mean that they are mistreated, but what mm. I mean is maybe the shooting hours are too long, they're not giving mm. enough breaks, you know, that mm. kind of thing. So I wanted to help get guidelines, legislation, contracts, and new industry standards in place. Mm. I wanted to be a driving force into that. Yeah, awesome. And so that, that's, that's, um, that's fed into a larger conversation. I guess there, there is like a real conversation now in, in the UK anyway, happening around, around all those things, the contracts and the, the um, the working conditions. Can you say what sort of where 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 are things right now? How 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 is that discussion and process coming along? Um, slowly but surely. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I've been I've been very fortunate in that people have been um, open to discussions to learning. Mm. Um, so I work very closely with the Personal Managers Association, Equity, who is the UK Actors Union. Mm. Um, Spotlight and um, and I'm a member of the Casting Directors Guild and the Casting Directors Association mm -hmm. so I work closely with all of them and I held a meeting in November 2019 mm -hmm. so just before pandemic hit mm -hmm. and um, I managed to get a room full of people from all of those places plus then game developers studios a couple of actors and we basically spoke about 
the industry, the state of it, where we're at now and where we'd like to be in the future, um, how we can cross um, uh, cross bridges together, how we can work together to create fair industry standards, what we can do about contracts and things like that. So that was that was a really great stepping stone. Mm. Um, and me and myself have drafted a contract for actors in video games. Um, however, there's not a union who can countersign it. Mm. So there's not a union who can countersign that so at the moment it's still a draft and that draft is available for all of my clients I send that as like this is what I expect to have a, a contract to look like for all actors that mm. I cast in a project mm. but at the moment we can't make it an official document okay um however there has been a big jump in that there is now an equity voiceover uh, okay. contract in place which includes fee guidelines mm. uh, and all of the largest voiceover studios in the UK have countersigned that and cool. agreed that so that's why that is now in place mm. so equity and you know we're, we're now just still trying to figure out the best way of getting our contract through for performance capture mm. but in the meantime we're still there we're still giving guidance and support to anyone and everyone that asks for it um, try and make the industry a better place anyway. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you so much for taking that job on and, and trying to push the industry forward that way. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's, it's like you said, it's, it's totally, it's, it's a wild west. There's no, uh, nobody seems to know what's going on. So I think, yeah, standards yeah. and formalizing things is, it's, it's also really hard work. And uh, yeah, I, I'm sure that it's, um, it's not always a fun process, uh, <laughs> but, but thank you for taking on that fight to try to try to kind of make things better because because um, uh, obviously with games the, the the budgets can be so high not all games obviously that you know but there's so much money in the games industry um, and and obviously it's it's a uh, it's an issue the games industry has issues separate from <laughs> the way it treats actors anyway um, yeah. so I thought it was interesting to hear that the in a way it's it, there's no if there's no union of game makers like that's also a problem in the games industry that there's all these conversations about game makers being able to unionize and that that's having a knock-on effect that not not being able to to standardize things in our industry because they don't have anything standardized is that is that right yeah definitely and it's the same as vfx in general so mm. if you look at vfx company who work on a big film they're in the same boat vfx departments don't tend to be unionized either mm. and so you might have 200 people work for a, a massive VFX studio and they will work on a huge game and they've given two years of their lives and then they're told that they have 20 credit slots for the film. And so all of these 180 people aren't being credited for their work. Hmm. And so, you know, there are issues because it's it's grown so exponentially and so fast alongside the film and television industry, you know, games and VFX, mm. that it's kind of just sprouted up as this wild west, as a sort of free for all. Mm -hmm. um, there are, yeah, there are issues dotted everywhere. And I think we have to be sensitive to that whilst also going, I understand that you've got annoying things and you're not being credited, but we're not either. And we want to change that. Mm -hmm. So, that's yeah. what I try to do. anyway. Yeah. And that's great. You're in kind of a because you're you're sort of as the casting director, you're in a you're in a sort of connecting relationship between creators and, and the artists. So you're you're everybody wants to be on your good side or everybody wants to everybody mm -hmm. likes you in the in the relationship. So you're actually a really good oh, sort of person to go back and forth between <laughs> the yeah, I mean may, maybe maybe that's romanticizing <laughs> it a bit, but you're in a, you're you're again kind of in a unique position to go back and forth between the two sides and kind of yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and i think it's very difficult for actors have to have that conversation on their own yeah um especially if they're not represented yeah so yeah um, that that's actually a really good segue i wanted to move into um because a lot of our audience are performers um i, I think i mentioned that motion capture is still a, a sort of you know fledgling industry here in denmark mm -hmm. um there's a lot more going on in sweden but the, you know it's sort of it's 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 arriving slowly and it's arriving you know like small scale projects with inertial suits and that kind of thing so it's it's sort of just 
entering awareness. But I, also a lot of Danish actors work internationally. Um, it's very common for, you know, Danish actors often speak English very well, so they're often trying to get roles in English language performances. Um, so yeah, so I wanna, I wanna get some, do some practical um, actor casting questions, if that's all right with you. Yeah. Cool. Um, so first of all, I guess, uh, in general, what do you think are, if you, if you can narrow it down, like what, what are the most important qualities uh, or, or skills or, or sensitivities for a performer to have uh, when, when trying to get into motion capture for games and, and film? Just be a good actor. Yeah. <laughs> I know that that is simplifying it massively, <sighs> but if you're going to embody someone who not only is potentially so very different from yourself, but is in a completely different medium because they're virtual, mm. you need to be a completely connected actor who can fully embody a character hmm. and um, when I talk about that physical connection I'm talking about being able to inhabit their breath hmm. and show that breath and hmm. and things like that so um, motion capture and performance capture shoots often move very quickly as well so that's why it's really you know all of this ties into just being a really good actor and honing your craft. Mm. Uh, because when you're a connected actor that's able to dig deep and um, find truth in any character that you're given, then things like breath placement and, um, and weight and gravity and things like that can be played with much easier, mm. I think. Mm. Um, there are certain things and certain skill sets which I think lend themselves really nicely to performance capture. Mm -hmm. So I really think that puppetry has a very close link to performance capture because in puppetry, your whole job as a puppeteer is giving life to something outside of your own body. And there's no ego in that. You can't have any ego. Mm -hmm. um, and if you try and stand in a lycra suit <laughs> in a studio with an ego, you're going to fail. Yeah. So you need to use that ego and also use those same techniques of embodying and giving life to a character that's not necessarily you. So that's why you can use the screens that are around the studio and stuff mm. and, and look at finding truth that way in the character. Yeah. Um, and then that, you know, goes hand in hand with things like physical theatre and movement and um, Lecoq skills or Commedia dell'arte and mask work and, you know, all that, mm. that sort of thing, I think, is they, they cross over skills quite mm. nicely. Mm -hmm. and obviously, if you want to be cast in the new Warhammer or Gears of War or something like that, then you probably want to learn how to fight and do stage combat or firearms or things like that. And mm -hmm. all of those extra skills that maybe you enjoy could feed in quite nicely to potential auditions and mm. work. Mm. Um, just, just quickly, I want to say, I, it always makes me so happy when you mention puppetry. So thank you for, <laughs> for doing that. Because I totally agree. It's, um, they're, 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 they're really complimentary, nice crossover skills. And you're exactly right as to why. It's that, you know, as a puppeteer, you have to, the first thing you have to learn is the, the sort of gaze of, of, you know, it's not about you. You're, you're giving all of your focus over to another creature, to this object that you're bringing to life. Um, and that's certainly my experience. That's exactly why I love doing motion captures because it's so close to the, the, the mask work and puppetry work and things that are sort of my original theater background. So yeah, it always makes you happy when I hear you mention that. <laughs> um, Breath is so important in puppetry as well. Exactly, as in yes. yes. As soon as you start breathing for a puppet or a virtual puppet, let's mm -hmm. say, both of them die completely. Yeah, yeah. The breath is the life that you're giving it. And that is mirrored, completely mirrored. A hundred percent. Yeah, we spend lots of time in the puppetry training that I've done. There's a lot of time just, to, yeah, let the puppet stand and breathe. Because then, and, and it, it's, it's yeah, it just, that, that tiny movement, that tiny, like we, we just pick up on that. And it's, it's, it's always the key to, to yeah, saying to to create starting the illusion that this this inanimate object is actually alive and is imbued with some sort of spirit or life. Um, so yeah, I totally agree. Is um, uh, going on the breath thing for just a second. 
the the um, motion capture uh, technology changes so fast uh, mm -hmm. that I think you know there was. Um, this connects to breath, I promise. Um, th there was a time, I think, in the past where you know you maybe had to sort of play up your actions a little bit. That like if you were, you know, if you wanted to show that the character's breathing, you might actually have to like heave your shoulders, for instance. How mm -hmm. is that still the case, or or are we at the sort of level with the technology now where where you can basically be, you can have your own breath uh, versus sort of animating it? So. I've always, I, I, don't, I like to describe motion capture or performance capture performance as like really intimate theatre in the round mm. because you don't need to project your performance in the same way that you would for theatre, mm. but you need to remember that the audience could be anywhere and that you're being recorded 360 degrees. So you're, there's no room for rest. Yeah. Now, within that, your performance should be more theatrical in that you're not just performing head and shoulders like you might do for TV. You know, if you're told, well, this is a close shot, then you might give everything here or give a super subtle performance because the camera is so close. Mm -hmm. um, motion and performance capture, again, this is all sweeping statements. Yeah, so yeah, you might turn yeah. to the studio and their tech isn't doing this, but on the whole, it's all so advanced and so good now that it does pick up all of those nuances, mm. which is great. Mm. But there still needs to be this undercurrent of breath and life. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean constant movement or constant like chest movements. Mm. There needs to be life because as soon as you're really still, mm. the avatar still dies. Mm. And I think that undercurrent, that that fizz of breath under your performance in the same way that it gives you life on stage mm. gives you life in performance capture mm. so i don't want it projected i don't want it overperformed or exaggerated mm -hmm. but i want it there yeah. all the time and that's something that a lot of screen actors can struggle with mm. because they're so used to being told exactly where the camera is exactly how tight it is and then being able to switch off the rest of their body yeah yeah um, and it needs to be connected at all times. Yeah, cool. I I'm mean, gonna we're, we're word connected. I'm very sorry. <laughs> no, that's good. We're, we're just about out of time, and actually, I, I, I um, silly of me, I left kind of one of the most important questions for the end. Um, I want to ask you quickly what advice you might have for for actors here in Denmark. Um, the, you know, looking to get work in the industry or looking to get into it. Um, I, I mentioned in, uh, earlier that um, a lot of Danish actors might be self-represented. Uh, we don't have the same. We don't have. A, there's some. There is a system of, of of agents here, but it's it's kind of it's one that's not really accessible to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. A lot of Danish actors are, are used to sort of yeah, just representing themselves. What should they do? Is it even possible for them if they want to? you know, get into the, the sort of bigger stuff that's happening around Europe, uh, what, what, what should they do or can they? So I would always say start by looking at your marketing material. Think mm -hmm. of yourself as a business. Mm -hmm. So look at your CV, look at your show reels and make sure that they are selling you in the best way possible and mm -hmm. how you want to be promoting yourself. I love two separate show reels. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I love it when people have an acting reel that shows me them as an actor. And then I love a separate skills reel, mm. whether that's showing me that they are brilliant circus performers or that they do puppetry or that, um, or that they have all these stage combat skills, you know, whatever that is, have that separately. Mm -hmm. um, and then pitch yourself. So if you have all of that, and you know that this game developer shoots all of their games in-house mm. and then probably has a casting director in-house, mm. then contact them and mm. say, hi, this is me. This is why I'm writing to you because mm. I like the sorts of games you make and mm. I, I can offer you these skills mm. and pitch yourself that way. Mm -hmm. Now, you're all super lucky because there are amazing studios across Europe mm. who, if I'm honest, have now shut off from using UK-based actors mm. because of Brexit. Um, because we're all dumb and we voted Brexit. So 
um, use that mm. and and just research, research, research. Look mm. at studios, look at game developers, animation studios. Talk to and get in touch with. Reach out to um, indie game developers mm. that maybe do just have a couple of inertial suits, but are really looking at bringing an actor in to give life to their characters yeah. and see if he can be the actor that can do that for them. Mm. Mm. Um, and I think that's really important. Have a purpose as to why you're contacting them in particular. Mm. I think that's really important. Um, you don't need to be a gamer. You don't need to be an avid gamer, but still do some research mm. because otherwise it's so easy to ignore emails. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you don't will be ignored, you yeah. know? So that help? That yeah, I think so. So, so, so yeah, so basically, obviously the age old have good material, um, but have, have mm -hmm. material that both shows you as an actor and, uh, uh, shows what other skills you might have. And then it's basically direct marketing either to animation studios or should people, what about contacting motion capture studios as well? Like if there's a big stage, yeah. do you write to them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they might do some casting in house as well. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So the, the best route for people who aren't represented is to, to sort of, yeah, go directly to the source of where the work might be coming from. Cool. And I, if, you, if you are interested, if you are represented as well, do it. Mm. Yeah, I yeah, yeah, did. totally. Yeah. I still, I still do that, even though I had an agent. Yeah, that's true. I shouldn't, I shouldn't assume that people with casting agents just have access to all the, the jobs. So that's, um, yeah, but that's, I think we're, we're out of time for the day. Uh, but, um, Thank you so much for joining us, Jessica. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. And um, I feel like I could probably talk for another half hour if, <laughs> if there was time. But um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, um, yeah, for joining I us. Cool. Yeah, I think it was fantastic. Cool. Yeah. frozen wilds have punished us with biting cold and deadly steel but never like this new terrors driven by an evil shrouded in smoke and ash so many have died i fear even the spirits have forsaken us we don't need spirits we need answers track this evil to its source and we can kill it. <laughs> A demon that frenzies the machines? How do you kill that? It's kind of my specialty.
Good. All right. So our next guest is Trina Jensen, who is a acting coach and occasional performer and director. Trina is uh, Danish, but you're based in LA and you've been living there for 32 years. 32 years. Uh, thank you for coming back to Denmark to teach the motion capture course at the Danish uh, National School of Performing Arts next week. Yes. Or video game acting, I should say, because it's Two, two days, days of voiceover work, work and then three days of motion capture. Yes. Yeah. The awesome. third day is the transition day between. Right. right. Yes. Cool. So, so uh, yeah, yeah, that was the trailer for Horizon Zero Dawn, Dawn the Frozen, Frozen Wilds. Can, can you tell us uh, what, what your involvement, involvement was in that? My involvement with that was that I ran a uh, recording studio in Los Angeles at the time, Vault 501, mm -hmm. uh, also known as uh, OM Los Angeles. Okay. And uh, we were the recording studio for all of the dialogue for uh, both the main game, which most of it was done in London, mm -hmm. and then uh, the entire Frozen Wild pretty much was done at the Los Angeles studios. Okay. And also all the motion capture for that as well. Was, was done at your studio? studio. Not, at, not at our studio, but in LA. It was, okay. Yeah, at Sony's um, volume. Okay. And is, is that, that why, if the, if the original game was recorded in London, uh, is that why they moved the Frozen Wilds recording to LA, was to, to be in the same place as the motion capture? or? It was part of it, but also several of the large roles mm -hmm. um, are actually um, living in Los Angeles. Okay. So it, it, it made it easier to do a lot of the recording there. Sure, yeah, yeah that, that makes sense. sense. Um, and, and so you've, you've had, had a, a sort, sort of a, 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 a long, long and winding journey, journey in your artistic path. path. How did you wind up in video games? Well, well I, I went to drama school, school. Yeah. Uh, 30, 30 years, years ago. ago. Yeah. Uh, I have a very good friend who happens to be the owner of that studio in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I've always been involved with his process for the last I say 15, 17 years, as he sort of began to really brainstorm on how to get heightened performances in video games, mm -hmm. like really good quality acting. And so that's, that's, that's kind of what happened. And then when he decided to open up a studio in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. he asked if I would run it for him. Okay. So that's kind of how I, I ended up there. And just, just so, so I understand, understand, when you say heightened performances, you mean sort of elevating the quality of video game performance or, or heightened in the sense of like... No, no, no cinematic quality, okay. like, like the kind of stuff you could win awards for, like they already yeah. do in England, yes. but not in the U.S. yet. Ah, okay, so that, that you, you feel like there's a quality difference between how things are in the U.K. versus how they are in the U.S. at the moment? Uh, no, but just BAFTA already has a category ah, for video game, okay. right? And the Oscars doesn't. We have, we have the video game awards, but that's obviously an industry thing. Right. They're not yet honored at the, at the larger you know, awards ceremonies. I got it. I'm with but you. I think that's a matter of time. Yeah. yeah. Games are obviously becoming a huge part of the entertainment industry. They're worth more than, than films in terms of the amount of turnover every year. So, yeah, it must be just a matter of time. Um, when was that studio, or w w when did you come into that studio? Around what year was that? The studio opened in 2000, the beginning of 2016. Okay. And I came in a little bit later into that year. Yeah. But Mark, throughout the 10 years prior to, had had productions in the US. Okay. So he would come over and record certain aspects of a game or something like that with US actors. And what he really wanted was to build a studio in, in Los Angeles. And uh -huh. that's what he did back then. Okay, cool. And, and that, that sort, sort of coincides, coincides I guess, to, to, if he was working, working in the UK and then now in 2016 is sort of, the, the, the idea, idea of the like prestige, prestige video game where, where the acting is so good that it's, it's, it's going to be award worthy. Um, that's, that's sort of in that transition period, period or the tail end of that transition period, period right? right? Like that, I think we, we, we were talking to David Bateson earlier about the, earlier about the earlier days of, of the voiceover industry, and I, I think it wasn't such a glamorous job at that point. point. So, so somewhere, somewhere, somewhere in the last 10 years, there's been a transition, don't you think? Absolutely a transition, and also there's a, there's a lot of uh, a talk about it, especially in LA, because we have a, a community there of VO actors that pretty much do exclusively VO, right? Yeah. They show up to work in pajamas and ponytails, yeah. and they like it that way. <laughs> and as the games get larger and larger um, budgets, mm. they really want to bring in some of the more known stars from respectively film and TV. So yeah. there's been a little bit of a sort of an adjustment, I think, that that's happening as a result of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. So, so your, your work, work as, a, as, as, a, um, as, as an acting, acting coach, coach uh, is, 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 is really focused, focused on, on, or at least you're, you're, I know you do a lot of different things, but your, your work as an acting coach for video games specifically is, is very focused on uh, making sure the actors are in the right mindset or sort of preparing them for how video games work, is that right? Yes, and, and I think it also applies to mocap to a certain degree mm. because you will only get, and that's the big difference between all this new technology and the traditional way that actors are trained, mm -hmm. is that you don't get a script. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of the time, you won't necessarily even know what character you're playing. Mm -hmm. If you're one of the leads, then yes, you will be part of the process. You may get lots, lots of early renderings and mm -hmm. drawings and you know, have some sort of interactive mm -hmm. with the development team. 
but for most of the rest of the characters, which in games can be several hundred characters, right? Yeah. They will also, because auditioning is very expensive. Mm -hmm. So when we audition, we will bring in just the lead actors, the ones that we're really looking for, yeah. but everybody who comes in who does a great performance, but who isn't right for that, yeah. will obviously end up being cast in the game. Okay. And so what that means effectively, right, is when they come in to the studio to record, they have read for a character that's not the one they've been cast as, yeah. so they have no idea what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that mindset, right, how do, you, how do you do that? When you don't have a script and you can't extract the information that you need ahead of time to prepare, mm -hmm. then how do you prepare in that kind of a scenario? That's, that's really where my, my work is focused. So, so how, how do you prepare, prepare for that scenario? scenario? <laughs> you hack the process, okay. just, just, like, just like they do in games. Mm -hmm. you, um, you work from the body. So a lot of the work that I do is, is based on getting actors into their bodies, uh, working with animals for mm -hmm. inspiration to characters. Mm -hmm. Um, grounding to the senses mm -hmm. so that it's very physically grounded. That's also turned out to be really good work for VO actors because yeah. they tend to forget that they have a body yeah. <laughs> if they're not doing motion capture. Yeah. And, uh, and the other way to think of it too is to, um, to think of every single character you've ever done. Mm. And whether it was you know, a full production or something you did at school or in a workshop or even for an audition, mm -hmm. if you've spent a significant amount of time preparing, then that creature, that character lives inside of you, mm. and you can pull it out mm. and make little adjustments and make it work for something, mm. and they don't know that you didn't make it up right then and there on your feet, yeah. Yeah. right? And then you come in with some back history and some of all those things so that it doesn't become flat work, right? Yeah. But it's deep, rich, and textured, mm. like how we want good acting to be. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so it's, it's about, about sort, sort of, of a lot, lot of the craft, craft that you're teaching is, is being, being prepared, prepared to work on the fly and being prepared to kind of just jump out into the blue and hope that something happens or, or d d d d and also I guess reading a situation it's a form of sight reading almost isn't it just sort of like yeah, yeah. in the yeah. studio definitely, definitely but you will have yeah. your you'll have your script up on a screen in front of you you never even get the paper yeah. Yeah. and if we were to print out video game scripts right they would be like just tall yeah. it's just yeah. you, we can't do that yeah. um, so sight reading is definitely something you want to be able to do if you have a strong improvisational background mm -hmm. and then I think the courage, mm. more than anything, to believe that you were cast because they saw something in you. Yeah. And so not be so maybe focused on pleasing, yeah. but really just taking the risks and jumping mm. in. Because when we sit in the directing situation and an actor comes in and they give us something, right, then you instantly know that this actor can do lots of different things. So even if that thing wasn't right, we can adjust it. Yeah. Right? But if they're trying to please and they're really cautious, then it's very hard to, to pull it out. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, re it's really, I think, about being courageous and being bold and jumping in and yeah. taking lots of risks. So, so give, give them, give, give, give the, 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 the people you're working for as, as much material as possible, possible to see who you are and what you're capable of so that they can kind of shape it. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And also there's a flow to it, right, which we'll, of course, go into much more in detail next week with yes. the workshop, right, is that we, yeah. we generally want three different takes mm -hmm. and they need to be subtly different. Yeah. Yeah so that it's still the same person saying them, but yeah. subtly different, because that's what the game engine needs yeah. for the various different player choices, right? So it's also important to have, I think, a little bit of a, an understanding of the architecture of games. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously there's mocap that has nothing to do with games, mm -hmm. and then there's mocap that is part of games. Yeah. So yeah. it's a lot of overlap. Yeah. You mentioned that um, if, if you, you printed out a video, video game, game script, script, it would be this tall. tall. I, I know that, that um, a lot of modern, modern uh, uh, voiceover yeah. studios have quite sort of, complex, uh, sophisticated sort of architecture and systems for, for, for how to give the actors as much information as possible. Can you just talk about briefly how that worked in your studio? Like, <clears throat> you know, if you have an actor in the room and you're like, okay, we're recording, I don't know, five characters in this session, H how do you give them that information? Well, Mark, Mark has developed, developed something that he calls CDT, which is Creative Dialogue Tools. And it's okay. something that's actually proprietary to his studios. Okay. And then the actual developers that they work with will typically get a copy of it as well. Yeah. And what it is, is it's, it's sort of a, it's, it's a whole rethinking of the process. So casting very early so that the actors can come in and the animators can actually see them. Mm -hmm. And when we have the actors in the studio, what happens is, is um, we have the imagery ready at a click of a button so you can see the image of the of the character mm -hmm. you can see the image of the scene or at least something that looks like it so you have an idea of what the world looks like mm -hmm. and also um, we lay down the tracks for the other actors because typically VO work is done one at a time in the studio yeah. sometimes we will do multiples we've had as many as four in the in the booth at the same time which is okay. but that's unusual yeah. but it's wonderful when it happens because then you can get that real live dynamic 
but to go back to when we lay down the track of the, what we call the feeder lines is then when you come in, then the lines that you are actually responding to, you're not going to be re you know, reacting with somebody reading them flat. It's actually the actor that's been recorded and that's being fed to you. Yeah. So there's different ways of doing it. But I think because that's not an industry standard, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily, you know, the way to go about it because it's not what it's going to look like for most people when they come into a studio. Yeah. But what that whole process has taught me is to empower actors to ask the right questions, yeah. right? Can I have a, a picture of the, of the character? Mm -hmm. Do you have some early renderings of what the artwork looks like, right? Mm -hmm. Am I in a noir or am I in a fairy tale? Yeah. And, and so the more that you can get from the devs, the writers, the director mm -hmm. that informs it, the easier you can put all of that together in the, in the human computer and then, and then bring something out through your body. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. cool. Um, we're, we're, we're getting close to the end of our session, but, but I wanted to, to go back to when I introduced you, we said you were an occasional performer. <laughs> I know that you have a, a background in, in dance and theater, and you're working on a, a theater piece that you want to, you want to blend uh, motion capture performance together with live uh, performance. Yes. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes. It, um, it was intended initially, it was something to do during COVID. Yeah. I, like everybody else, started working on a creative project. Yeah. And so I started writing, and the more I wrote this solo piece, mm -hmm. the more characters kept coming to life in it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I remember going to the guy that I work with um, and saying, I don't know how to do all these characters, right? This is supposed to be a solo piece, and I can't do this. And then I started thinking about it and the stuff that I'm teaching, and I thought, ah. Oh, a lot of it is fairy tale. Mm -hmm. So there's a narrator that's telling a story. Mm -hmm. And then there is the ugly duckling who you know, travels around in the different fairy tales. And that whole sequence lends itself really well to be motion captured and animated. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's essentially how it, how it came about, was okay. if I could get this animated, and then I can have the narrator interacting with the screen with the animation, then I've kind of solved a problem. Yeah. And, and also included a bunch of new technology that I work with anyway. And it would be an <laughs> opportunity to work with Rococo suits and all of that stuff. So yeah. 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 Cool. Okay, okay, so you're, you're, you're sort, sort of using it as, as a, a it, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's almost sort of adjacent to the way that um, solo musicians use like a loop machine or something. Not, not quite in the same way, but that you, you're, 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 there's a, it allows you to, um, it allows you as a single performer to become a bigger presence on stage than simply Yes, and also yeah. to include some of this technology that I enjoy so very much. And I think another piece of it, right, is and I think Simon talked a little bit about that this morning, is the democratization of the equipment, mm. right? The volume where this motion capture was recorded was Sony's big volume in Los Angeles, right? Yeah. It's the size of this room. There's, I think, 50 cameras, mm -hmm. and it costs several hundred thousand dollars, yeah. right? Not available. A Rococo suit is, I think they cost $2,500 in the US, and I'm assuming here, I don't know, 15,000 kroner. Yeah. That, that's something that you can do. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it can be used in all kinds of creative ways, which I think is really fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so there's, there's a whole new world kind of available now um, that, that the, the technology, technology is moving in that direction. direction. Um, so, so that's, yeah, yeah very, very cool. cool. Um, that kind of ties into our, our yes, next yes, guest yes, coming up soon, our, uh, a dance company that have done a, a, a live performance with a motion capture character as well. Um, we're going to have a short break now. And Selena, uh, you're going to lead a little, um, a little movement exercise during the break for anybody who wants to kind of get up and, and move their body around and, and shake off the stiffness of sitting in a chair for all day. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Cool. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes. So yes, we'll be back in uh, five minutes. Uh, stay here, do some stuff with Trina, take a break, and we'll be back soon with Nordic Beasts Dance Company. All right. So if you've been sitting in your chair and you're melting like we are here in the studio, then I suggest that you get up. And I am going to do a little bit of work from the Alexander Technique that works with the diagonals in the body. So you want to stand up and you want to put your feet sort of hip width apart, a slight crease in your hips and a gentle bend in your legs. And then imagine yourself nice and tall, your neck is free, your head floats upwards and away from your torso. And as all that space happens in your neck, your back can lengthen and widen. And you'll typically feel that happening on the breath. Some people like to imagine that when, you're when your back lengthens and widens, it's as if your back is smiling. And then what we're going to do, I hope I can do this with this uh, equipment on here and not hit it. We're going to do a little bit of, of diagonal movement. So you're going to be 
you're going to be swinging your arms very gently and allowing your head to move so your whole body is just gently swinging from side to side and then after a few of them go ahead and bring your head forward so you don't get dizzy but your body and your arms will keep swinging there we go and then allow your body on its own to just come to a rest okay, then we're going to do it again but we're going to add the legs make sure I'm not hitting anything so this time we're going to do the swinging again but you're going to go into a bent leg on the side that you're swinging towards so it'll look like this and then the thought this time is again that your neck is free and your head is floating upwards away from your torso and your back stays wide and long even as you do this and go ahead and let your head come forward again and just allowing your body to come back to a rest and just noticing how your body feels after this rotational stuff. Now we're going to do the one that's tricky. We're going to do opposite. So I'm going to be swinging into the straight leg and away from the bent leg. So it's going to be like this. And after a couple, go ahead again and feel free to move your head forward so you don't get dizzy. And allowing your body to come to a rest. And then just take a moment and feel your feet on the ground, how it's supporting you all the way up through your structure. Your neck is free, and your head is floating upwards and away from your torso. And your back is long and wide. And then take a little walk around wherever you are. I'm not going to do it because then I'll walk out of the camera, so I'll just walk forwards and backwards. But I suggest that you walk around just in a little circle. <laughs> And when you come back, you're just going to do a gentle shake, just a very, very gentle shake of your arms and your legs, and just shaking it out. And the last thing I want to leave you with is a way to give yourself energy. If you're drooping and you're in a meeting or you're in a thing like this and it's hot, you take one hand and you're going to squeeze the nail on the other hand, and it's just a little squeeze, 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 squeeze. And you go through all five fingers on one hand, and then you switch hands. It sends a quick message to your brain. We're hitting a bunch of meridian endpoints, actually, to give you a little, a little rush of energy. And it's something you can do discreetly under a table if you're really bored in a meeting. I'll leave you with that. Go take your break. Have coffee, water, tea. Go to the restroom. And we will continue in how many minutes? Five minutes. Five minutes. About five minutes. Bye.
I'm battling a virtual girlfriend live on stage. So there's an animated character and uh, me, live performer. My name is Nora Hannula. I'm a Finnish choreographer and a dancer based in Denmark. And I'm working on a piece called Nora Hannula versus Soma the Augmented Reality Girl, the ultimate battle. Yeah, and uh, this is the first piece of my Digital Love trilogy that handles, well, that is about intimacy merging with technology. That's what we're doing here at Boa We are motion capturing the character. So basically creating the show before it's done. <laughs> Which is interesting because animation is done in a different order than dance theater or theater performances in general. You can't really change anything two weeks before. We are now in good time doing all the motion capture work, testing the scenes, getting the right timing and yeah, then it's just up to me to learn my part when the character is there. The character will be standing with me on stage instead of it being on just the screen. So we will have an idea of a physical hologram. There's a screen that is very, very see-through in an angle of 45 degrees. So if we really need to touch, then I have to be on this line. So if I'm getting a punch on face, then I better be on this line because otherwise half of the audience sees that the punch was here and the other half sees that it was only here. So yeah, there's some technicalities that have to really be uh, rigorously followed. My name is Soma. I was designed to please my boyfriend Casper. Do you like me? Hi, boyfriend. We're having a duel. My boyfriend has a virtual girlfriend. I find out, I get very jealous. And well, it, it debates future of relationships when 3, yeah, 3D technology and 360 degree VR technology is getting to the point where you can touch and feel and the AI is so smart that you can't basically tell if it's a human or not. Like, is it cheating? Is it not? How does it affect relationships? And what should we think about it in general? Uh, though it's a humoristic take, I would say, to the subject, uh, there is this underlying layer of reality versus unreal, um, human versus machine. So to me, the show is about how amazing reality is. I love reality. I love sweat and bruises. And I think that's the interesting thing. Reality is not perfect. And that's why we love reality. And I think this show is all about that. Like you see me getting tired and bruised and smacked down by this animated character and you know that I did it for real. And she's just recording. The character is inspired by Japanese virtual girlfriends, all sorts of video game heroines. So we've taken elements from Street Fighter and uh, from that Love Plus game and gone a bit towards Lara Croft. And actually I find it's a beautifully symbolic way to battle technology or the idea of technology merging with intimacy because when I'm on stage I don't see the character. Uh, the audience sees the character. I'm just navigating in space and with sound cues. So in the same way that Facebook and all kinds of technologies in my phone, like it exists, but it doesn't really exist. Um, this character, it exists, but it, in my world, when I'm standing on the stage, it doesn't really exist. So I'm doing a duet with an imaginary partner. <laughs> so it's basically a solo with an element in it. Belinda Larsen, the main artist, and then she's helped by two others. Uh, and it's a, it's a crazy work because usually animation, if you hand animate and do it all from the bit and everything, then you work one year for 20 minutes. So we are now doing 45 minutes in pretty much two, two and a half months. So it's a crazy job and it's only possible because of the motion capture technology. Yeah, so she has had a very interesting time figuring out how, uh, how all these aspects work. Yeah, 
because it's really, really new. And it will be also a very interesting experiment for me because nobody has, uh, at least in Denmark, worked with this setup uh, in such a choreographically sp specific way. And uh, yeah, it will be very challenging. <laughs>
kind of a prototype phase. Mm -hmm. So they had just pushed out a customer friendly suit when we got our hands on it. Mm -hmm. So it was also having a bit of bugs and all sorts of things that had to be fixed on the way. <laughs> and a little bit of software updates. So nowadays the Rococo suits can do way more, uh, way easier than mm. back in 2018 when we were recording. Mm. But yeah, but it was basically out of necessity of knowing that we can't afford motion capture in another way. And also that we can't afford hand animation mm. because it, it's so labor intensive and it takes such a long time. Usually for a 45 minute piece, they would work a year or more and just it. Yeah, we couldn't afford that. So we just had to find a way around it. And that's how we came up with, OK, we must use this suit that has just been pushed to the market. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's <laughs> Cool, cool. So you realize it was sort of a good luck in a way. It was sort of the right, right idea at the right time. Um, Helena, had you? Um, oh, yeah. Sorry, go. On. Yeah, I guess so. But of course, I had to research it when I yeah. was doing budgets and stuff, and realizing how much money things cost. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and um, Helena, was that the first time that you did um, any performance with a with, with a motion capture suit, or had you tried it before working on this project? No, for me, it was really the first time. And also for me, motion capture suit, or maybe something that I thought about for Lord of the Rings, so these kind of yeah. movies that yeah. it's like mega mongus budget. So like what, when Nora said it, yeah, we're going to make a production about this. And like, what, wait? <laughs> <laughs> In the contemporary dance scene, that is the opposite of a lot of money. And mm. uh, so yeah. it was the first experience, but a really, really fascinating experience, I have to say. Mm -hmm. to, so, sorry. No, that's fine. Yeah, I was just gonna ask, how, how, can you can you talk a bit about how you approached it as a dancer? Like, so I guess you know, I, I guess if you're working on a big budget motion capture thing, either you'll have done some training on it, or at some point someone will like walk you through. Here's everything. But did you just sort of come in one day and say like, well, here's the suit. I got to figure it out. Or, or how how did that? Um, how did you introduce yourself to it and get to know it? Uh, it was kind of just uh, like go for it. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say. Yeah. Uh, I think we approached it like physically as a or as a dancer uh, mm -hmm. and kind of traditionally like we, me and Nora we were meeting up beforehand to create some of the material and then we were uh, Belinda Larson she was the uh, animating uh, expert and she was the one uh, working with the motion capture suit mm -hmm. so she was the one knowing how to use it how to work with it and for me it was basically put the suit on and uh, good luck okay <laughs> <laughs> Good. Take so care you, of the uh, take care of all the parts, and uh, that's it. <laughs> yeah. And so then, so so once you were the two of you were in the room and you had the suit on, can you talk about um, how different was the process of of choreographing this piece uh, from from sort of the way you would approach choreographing a normal dance piece? Can you, um, I guess, for both of you, really, how how did that uh, how did that process play out, and 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 what was different about it? Mm, yeah. Well, well, first of all, uh, <laughs> we had like two days to create each scene. So we used like the first day uh, to create material mm -hmm. uh, for the scene, improvise around it and set it. And then we had a day or in like worst case, two days, if something went wrong um, to record it. And each time we ended up with around 10 takes per scene. And Helena can maybe tell a little bit about <laughs> What was very frustrating about that? <laughs> Definitely the calibration. <laughs> the calibration and recalibration. And I think also the what we also talked about, like uh, the physical part and the technol uh, like the tech part had to meet each other. Like because maybe if me and Nora we did a perfect run, maybe it was something that wasn't working with the recording. So then you had to do it again. And then to yeah. maximize and try and get a perfect run for both of us where the physical material is interesting enough, the timing is, is good, and, uh, and the suit was working. This was the really tricky. Mm. Also, because it's physically exhausting, and this thing of being on and off is, uh, at least as a dancer, it can be pretty hard when you go full mm. up, and you need to stand still, like really what it is calibrating. <laughs> Yeah. Don't move, stand straight, and, and from that, and then suddenly go for a full attack. It's, uh, <laughs> it's challenging physically yeah. to work in that. Um, mm. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. And there was some times when Belinda, we had the perfect run and Belinda would say, we lost the arm. We have to do it all again. And we we're like, no. <laughs> it was really, really frustrating. Yeah. So it was a compromise between whatever the suit could record and mm. uh, our best run of those that it could. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I think in other aspects of uh, when you said, like, how is it differently from a normal creation process is that mm. usually also with the material, uh, you, you create it and then you rehearse it and then you work for a couple of months, like mm. refining it and developing it. And then when you are premiering, that's the moment when it's perfect. But here was the opposite. Like you, we were creating and recording right away and it had, just had to be great. And uh, also to just jump into that and say, like, OK, this is what it is. And uh, it was very, it was very different for me, but I mean, also an experience to say like, yeah, let's go for it. We try and make it as clean as possible, but uh, very, very different from a normal creation process. Yeah. Mm. So I, I want to yeah. just go back a little bit there. Did I, did I hear correctly that the, the motion capture section that you, you, you only, you, it only, you created the whole thing in three days. Did I catch that right? That it was what? Uh, as in each, each scene, okay. as in. The, the show was scripted beforehand by me okay. and uh, Peter Melago mm -hmm. and uh, or Modigo. And um, yeah, so each scene had a theme and we knew what it's about and we had to choreograph it and then we would make material and then we would record it so that we are both doing the scene basically. But my part can still be adjusted. So the focus was on Helena should be as great as possible. Mm. Uh, during that time, as in, of course, I should also know what I'm doing, but we mm. knew that uh, if we are not in physical contact, uh, then I can still adjust myself uh, somewhat. But the video that we recorded of the motion capture was also a reference for the animator Belinda, so mm. that she would put the character on stage at the actual place that it should be at hmm. so it was also important that i was in the right positioning so yeah. each scene was recorded in two to three days because we were in a very tight schedule okay but all in all i think it was around three weeks that we were working in bora bora uh, yeah recording okay. with the suit and later we had a, another process for for nora rehearsing her material also but the recording maybe around three weeks okay okay that makes a little more sense and and so do i so then <laughs> There was never a point where you recorded the entire uh, piece in one take. You sort of you did you did it in segments, and then the animator blended it together. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. it had to be done like that. The suit couldn't handle more than short segments. Yeah, sure. Basically. So to get some clean animation, you had to calibrate it often so that it didn't lose a leg or become extremely weird or lose the ground and just float around in space or yeah it was yeah. Uh, it had to be cut into pieces yeah sure sure um i wanted to ask um helena what, what was it like for you to to i guess it's different from a normal dance piece in the sense that you 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 do your you do your dance and then you're gone from the or you're off stage anyway did you have a hard time um did you did you feel anything in sort of like having to let the character go uh, in a way that you wouldn't on another piece? Was there any sort of like, oh, well, sorry, now I have to, now I have to just let her be her own thing? Or did... <laughs> uh, no, actually, uh, I, I kind of enjoyed this process. I think mm. that's the, usually when you're working on a piece, you can never see it from the outside and how mm. it actually is from the outside as, as an audience. Mm. So for me, that's an enormous pleasure. Mm. to record and then uh, and then let go so now i feel also because afterwards in the beginning i felt more connected with soma because i remember the recordings but then afterwards i'm i've been helping nora to be the outside eye like rehearsing for spacing and stuff so now i feel more connected with nora's character okay. in a way that ah. i don't be like soma, soma is living her own life and then i'm i'm uh, <laughs> connected with nora uh, so that was actually good and and the interesting fact because also, it was my first time being outside, and I had—I don't think I've been, ever been so nervous in my whole life either mm. to, <laughs> yeah. to see a performance from the outside and knowing exactly what Nora is going through and like try to help her. And <laughs> so it has been a very easy and good process, I have to say, to step out and mm. see it from the outside. Okay, cool. But that's actually uh, just to add, like, because um, I don't see the character when I'm on stage, 
Yeah. That's also why Helena is extremely important outside because every time we stage the show and the two videos are put on top of each other and adjusted to fit the stage because of the projection being always a little bit in a different distance. So that will make the character either shrink a bit or mm. grow a bit and move also a little bit in the space. So every time we go on stage, Helena has to be there to check that whatever marking I have this little line on the stage to show me where I could be or should be, then she will, you know, help me adjust uh, and rehearse yeah. the thing so that it actually looks like we are connecting with the character. Yeah, so that, that it's incredible. Uh, it, that, yeah, you, you, there's a there's like a calibration process. You have to you have to re you have to I guess yeah calibrate the show to the space every time you perform it, and that that must be how long does that process take normally? Like how how is it sort of uh, have you gotten to a point with it where you're like okay you know you can kind of do it in half an hour or is it is it kind of an ordeal every time you move into a new space with the project? Mm, well. I don't think it's that bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, every time we go somewhere with the project, we have to use at least a full day and night to build it up anyway because mm. of the screen. And yeah, it's a big setup. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think it's minor adjustments because those things matter mm. uh, spatially. Uh, yeah. So it's very small. And of course, at the studio, we have rehearsed the, you know, approximate or what it should be, but then it's small things like, okay, the hit should be a little bit lower, okay. a little bit below your shoulder, hmm. not at the shoulder line because she's a yeah. bit smaller now. Yeah. That kind of stuff. Okay. Okay. So it's a lot of small detailed work basically. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so um, we're getting close to the end of the time. So I just want to ask you now that you've done the piece and, uh, and, and you know, you've, you've gone through the whole process, w would you do it again? Would you do another project with motion capture on stage? Mm, what do you think, Elena? Uh, that was an interesting question. And I think uh, for me, like, sure, if someone would ask me, I would do it. But I think I wouldn't push for it in this moment. <laughs> do it myself, not because of the experience that it was bad or anything. But for me, it's a little bit the same as if you create, you don't create the same piece twice. And uh, then it would have to be an aspect that is interesting enough to, so you feel you can add something new instead of just reproduce and use the same idea. Mm. Um, so in that sense, maybe it would be it would be interesting to do it again, but I don't feel the necessity myself to mm. investigate more in that line. Let's say. Mm. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, I mean the the piece and the way that we did the piece came out of the concept. It didn't start with the technology, or it didn't start with we want to use this kind of a way to have the character on stage. So first came the idea, and then I realized how it could be done. Um, so definitely it's, yeah, if motion captures at some point in the future will fit the concept that I'm working on, then of course I will use it, but I don't, yeah, I wouldn't start from it has to be used or, yeah, yeah I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, also look at a, a little thing that if, if to do it again, I think also that process will be a lot easier. Having <laughs> 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 True. I think we learned it like I don't know if we were naive but we at least we were uh, kind of learning in the process and I think we yeah. really learned how to work with it and the importance of like this magical line that you're using for that so the audience is seeing the character in the same height and space where we are so this like also to create material with these limitations mm. I think we learned quite a lot and the exactness of it yeah. That uh, we were learning it a little bit in the process, but uh, so I think it would be smoother the next time. But uh, yeah, <laughs> we will go through harder <laughs> lessons. Cool. Yeah, Good. definitely. We're um, <laughs> so we're just about at the end of our time here, so I'll, I'll ask you real quick. Do you want to each say one sentence about what you're working on now and where where people can see your work today, or or soon? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, actually, the thing that I'm working on now is called Sweet Constructed Intimacy Experience. And um, that one actually came about because of this 3D piece having so many limitations mm -hmm. about where the audience can be and what distance can, they can be at. And the theme uh, in the show, the 3D show, was quite intimate, but I could not get intimate with the audience, mm -hmm. uh, if that makes sense. So I was exploring on the side 
uh, what could this team do in a more intimate uh, performance concert hmm. kind of a setup. So that's now what I'm doing. Um, and that is premiering in October. Cool. Fourth Fantastic. Of October. Fourth of October <laughs> in, in Denmark. Yeah. Yes. At yes. the K Select at the Royal Theater. Awesome. I, or, or no, sorry, sorry. Kongli Theater. Is that the same thing? It is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Same sorry. thing. Yeah. My uh, day uh, knowledge. Is <laughs> and and Helena, do you want to say say something quickly? What are you working on? Uh, well, I'm uh, gonna be based in Spain still this year, working. Uh, so I'm uh, gonna start a new project. Now I just finished a premiere, uh, and you do it for me and another girl here in the streets. But now I'm gonna start with a new project about uh, female wrestling. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> awesome. All right. So we're going gonna, gonna to wind it up there um, and move on to the, the final guest for the day. Thank you both so much for joining us. It was really cool to talk to you. And it's, it's such a cool project. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you yep. for inviting us. Take care. Yeah. Um, so we'll be back in just a moment with our final guest for the day, Maunus Brun. Um, obviously, we're a little bit behind on our time schedule, but we're, um, we're going to wrap it up uh, with Maunus by... Uh, by roughly the time we were expecting to anyway. So come back in just a moment and we'll be talking to Manus Boone. Should not have come to this, old friend. If you gave no quarter in life, you would receive none in death. Go to your homes. I will lay them to rest. Go to your homes! Dag accused me of betrayal. He accused me of breaking my oath. And this, this is the answer I gave him. Now you will hear the truth unmanaged. None, none more than me wishes for Sigurd's safe return. You know this. You know this. All of you. And I will burn the fields and dredge the rivers of Wessex to find him. That, that is my oath. That is my oath. I will find Sigurd. You will not be without your Jarl, as I promise. All right. Welcome, Welcome back, back, everyone, uh, for, for our, our final guest, guest of the day, Maunus Boon. Boon. Uh, thank, thank you so, thank you so much for joining us, Maunus. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you played, played Ivor, the male version of Ivor, in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Valhalla. 
Yes. yes. And, and that, that was the scene we just saw from it. Um, we noticed here when we were watching that it was perhaps a little bit dark. So do you want to give a quick recap of the scene just in case it was dark on the uh, audience end as well? Uh, well, this is, this is always a big scene after a killing of uh, one of the mm. major characters in, in Eivor's uh, settlement mm -hmm. um, after a duel. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so that was basically it. Okay, cool. So, um, am I right in thinking that um, Assassin's Creed was your, it was your first experience with doing a motion capture project, is that yeah. right? Cool. So, I think I'm going to start out with the, the most obvious question uh, that a lot of the, the actors watching at home might want to ask is, how did you get that job? <laughs> um, well, I, I auditioned for it. <clears throat> uh, I did a self-tape. But I didn't know that it was uh, Assassin's Creed. Yeah. I was uh, auditioning for this uh, animated series called The Black Wolf Saga okay. um, and thought that sounded pretty cool. Uh, yeah. I'll do that. Yeah. And then uh, a few weeks later, my agent called me and said, uh, so remember that, that, uh, that tape you did? So they want to see you in London now for a two-day uh, audition. And we now know that it's Ubisoft that are producing it. So, yeah. so this could be the next Assassin's Creed game, but we, we still don't know. Mm. Um, so I, I flew over there, not really knowing what I was doing. I, I got some extra scenes. Um, I was auditioning for another character in my first tape, but, uh, but when I went to London, they wanted me to still cast on that uh, specific character, but also the lead. Mm. Um, so I went over there and the first day I, when I, came into the room, they're like, oh, hey, Magnus, so this is the next uh, Assassin's Creed game. And this, yeah. so then yeah. suddenly, okay, this is it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. This is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And then I did two days there. And the second day, they only wanted to see me for the lead character. Okay. And it went quite well, yeah. uh, and <laughs> which was, I'm glad. <laughs> but then after that, um, I remember my agent getting texts from the casting director going, okay, they love Magnus, and they, uh, it's so good. It's like, okay, we've, we've got it. And then we didn't hear anything for two months. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. So there was a lot of executive producers that had to still go, OK. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess that was how I, uh, I, I got it. Mm -hmm. And one thing I, I learned from, because I've, I've done a lot of editions and self-tapes for films and television, yeah. but what they do during these um, game editions they, they, they just turn the screen around so that they're not watching the actual footage, <coughs> they're just listening. Yeah. 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 Because they, they, they can tamper their minds with, oh, he looks, he looks the part, or look at how she moves, it's wonderful. But, but in the end, especially for the playing character, if, yeah. if you don't like the voice mm. after listening to it for 200 hours, yeah. if you just want to kill yourself, yeah. Yeah. Then it's not the right voice. Yeah. So that's and and I remember the narrative director and also the creative director telling me that they went, went to the partners. So listen, listen to this voice. Can you just, just the brother and children and listen, listen to this. Yeah. Not watching the they obviously they watched it as well, but yeah. it was all about the voice in the end. Yeah. Um, and they they really liked my voice quality, mm -hmm. which I feel blessed <laughs> of because. <laughs> Um, it's been a blast doing this, uh, well, and still doing this game for yeah. nearly two years now. Yeah, because you had a, there, was, there was a DLC just announced, is that right, or it was a new thing? Yeah, we just, it, it just the first DLC we made is just originally came out, yeah. and another one is coming out later, yeah. and they just announced that more will happen. So okay. I'm, <clears throat> I'm now allowed to tell that more will happen. <laughs> I'm not saying what, <laughs> but, um, but it's fun. It's it's a really interesting character, and yeah. I I know the character so well now mm. that it's just jumping back into the to my own ball game. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. You've got a you've got a world you can get into. It's actually interesting. I just want to bring up quickly. We just said about that. You, you know, you can you can say that something is happening, but you can't say what. It's a really interesting part of of being an actor for video games is that the the level of secrecy that's involved in a project like this. That y y yeah. you, I assume you you probably have an internal process going on all the time is a sort of like, what, what am I allowed to say in this moment? What, what, what have they cleared? What haven't they cleared? That sort of thing. Yeah, yeah I've, I've had, had to. <laughs> I've done some podcasts where I'm just, because I'm just babbling on, you know, and it's like, 
Oh shoot, we this this is not live. No, no, it's not. Okay, okay. We, you need to cut that out, man. That's I, I can't say that. Does, that. does that person then get an, an, an NDA from the company as no, well? No, 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 no. I, 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 because I've, I've just I just said yes to some people doing cool podcasts. Um, so so I didn't run that by Ubisoft. Yeah. Um, I might have had to do that, but <laughs> shit happens and. Oh yeah, that's that's out. Uh, yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I guess once you, now, now that you've done, done the game, game they're not going to be like, "Hey, take a hike." <laughs> not unless you just trash them, you know. Yeah. Sure. yeah. And I wouldn't do that because they're lo all lovely people. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. 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 Cool. Um, and so, what was it like for you? Uh, it, coming into the motion capture studio for the first time. So first of all, actually, you you said that originally they were listening to your voice. Yeah. Uh, at what, at what point, point did you find out that you were also doing, doing the motion capture? capture? That was when I, I when I, actually when I auditioned for it because the two okay. parts I was up for was was in the main cast. Okay. <clears throat> it was they 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 brought I think six people to Montreal mm -hmm. to do the motion capture, yeah. um, and all the other actors um, were just doing the voiceover uh, AD, ADR. Yeah. Wise, so I knew I was doing motion capture, but I didn't know because I, I, I auditioned for that 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 smaller part. I didn't know the the amount of time I was to put into the voiceover, but also the motion capture, yeah. until we got the contract. Like, fuck me, this is this is the whole year. Yeah. This is it's like three weeks of uh, voiceover, and then fly to Montreal, do one hour and a half weeks of motion capture, and then back one day off. Three weeks of, of voice. Oh, it's like, okay. am I getting off at some point? Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> You're on a train now. Um, <laughs> so you were you were ping ponging back and forth between Canada and, and yeah, we, we we made a because Cecilia Stingspiel plays the the female lead. Yeah. Um, I recommended her. They couldn't find her. Yeah. They couldn't find the female lead. Okay. So I was already already doing motion capture, yeah. and they were they were tearing themselves apart, going fuck, we we we, we can't find the right voice. And I said. Wow. I, I could recommend some yeah. Danish actresses. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, please. And, and she, she was, was the, the top, top of my list. list. I think I gave them four or five names. Yeah. Um, and they auditioned with her um, and she got the part. Yeah. But she didn't want to go to, to fly mm. uh, to do the voiceover over there or in London. She did some in London, but she didn't want to fly all the time because she had a small kid. Okay. Um, and so, so she made demands. And that meant that because I was also Danish and we both lived in Copenhagen, they could set up the studio in Copenhagen and have Canadian uh, voice directors fly in here and yeah. stay for three weeks at a time. Yeah. Instead, which was nice. I'm all, I also have a family. You know? yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so so I, I flew over there once a month mm -hmm. for eight days mm -hmm. and did motion capture, mm -hmm. uh, a new badge, mm -hmm. and then went home and just did VO, yeah. VO, VO, and then they had the new badge and I flew over the back there again. So I think I did seven or eight full weeks of motion capture over there. Wow, um, okay. And, and how, how did you, you um, since, since you'd never done, done it before, before did, uh, what sort of uh, introduction to working in a volume did you get? Or did, you, did, they, did they spend a lot of time walking you through how everything worked? Or did they sort of just say like, well, here's your suit, go for it. What was that like? Well, I, I, I really don't remember that huge intro of it. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Um, but I remember the weird thing of is I, I came directly from shooting this um, Netflix sh uh, series I'm in, where I played this also Viking uh, warlord, mm. um, and I, I had my last day on that, and then I flew over there uh, a week later, mm. and the first thing I had to do was going from looking like a Viking to clean shave, yeah, yeah. to yeah. play another Viking, yeah. which was a weird transition. Yeah. Um, also, also, because then I, my, my, my great uh, costume and armor was just this black tight spandex suit yeah. with dots on, <laughs> looking like I was doing aerobics in the 80s, you know, yeah. like, but and now I have to be this hero? Yeah. And that transition in my head was weird. Mm -hmm. um, and also, so you're not, yeah, I, I know it's, it's just sandbags, but this is also, also the, the roots of Yggdrasil that you're jumping over now. Right. It's like, Okay, so the horse you're sitting on these boxes, are like, and I came yeah. from sitting on this enormous black stallion, looking like a billion, yeah. going to, ah, oh, how can I? Yeah. That that was that was weird for me. I remember the first day going, mm. okay, I just have to find, figure out. But the first scene I did um, was I, I I got a bow, mm. 
and I was hunting. And just the, like the getting that feeling of having the bow in my hand, mm. that gave me some weight. And how, how, how do you move your body when you're hunting? He was, so just getting that made me to sort of land in the character yeah. a bit more. And I, I really needed that in the beginning to just, okay, so, okay, so this is how we... And, and later on, I, 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 I had the, and the character has this axe, so I, I got that, and, and they made me a belt mm. with some weight in it, mm -hmm. so I would, because we all, all of us Vikings in that are just heavily armed. Yeah. We're walking around like this because yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, have, you know, we have no weight, so I got this heavy, heavy belt where I can also have my, have my axe in it. Mm -hmm. And just that gave me all the time, I was dangerous in, in some sort of way, and that, yeah. that small thing helped me. Just, just always stay in character. And I could, I could easily bring that up. I also, in that, if if you saw that in the video, yeah. <laughs> if it wasn't too dark, yeah. um, I also pull out my axe mm. in it, um, and that was because I had it. Yeah. You know, yeah. you, you can't, you can't just. I, I will mime this. Yeah. We did a lot of miming when you when you put your axe back or your bow. Yeah. You just do like this and drop it, and it falls to the yeah. floor. Oh, but God, but yeah. it's. Yeah. But then they will animate like, oh, he's so smooth. It's like, whoosh. Yeah. It's not just, yeah. Yeah. carry on, carry on, nothing to see. But the first, um, also, I remember a lot of, because you have these um, face helmets with, uh, I had four cameras on. Um, it's actually like this one. Um, with my shiny face there. Um, and I kept, banging it into the others because I, I wanted to get close, yeah. you know? Yeah. When you try, but you, no, 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 we'll put you that close in the end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, there was a lot of <laughs> cut for technical, yeah. Magnus, cut. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I just wanted to, oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. no, I'm a physical player. You know? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but you, you get used to that, yeah. you know? And then I think after a couple of days, I just loved it because mm. everything is possible yeah. when you do motion capture because even though it's, it's a room like this, but there's 300 cameras in the ceiling and you have three or four um, video uh, camera operators running around mm -hmm. doing steady cam, and you get four cameras on your face. Yeah. Everything is covered and you can look into the small screen over there and then you can actually see, okay, I'm moving. Yeah. Hello, yeah, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, very Viking-y stuff yeah, to do. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so because everything's possible, it's, it's, it, it just opens up a whole new world. Mm. But you have to sort of agree with that in your mind yeah. that this is, this is how it works. Yeah. Um, but um, I think it was um, Jessica uh, Jeffries that said something about um, it's like doing theater. Yeah. And I had the exact same feeling mm. But it was like sh we were shooting the rehearsal all the time. Yeah. Because it's like, so you just, you're just wearing this right now, but obvi obviously the real stuff and, and the extras will be there and you will be on the horse, but right now we don't have the horse because, you know, uh, insurance. So you sit on this box and this is how, you know, this is how we're going to do it, but, but, but play it for real. Yeah. You know, that was, yeah. that was sort of the feel. Yeah. Yeah. And then we did that for seven weeks, yeah. you know? <laughs> um, so you get used to it. Yeah. And it's just bloody amazing. Yeah. Also, there's, there's, there's not much waiting mm. yeah. um, because they're not sitting light. Mm -hmm. and, and we did it this way that we had two days of rehearsal each week. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we um, rehearsed all the scenes and it's a lot of scenes you can shoot yeah. <laughs> in a week. So we, yeah. two days where we rehearsed all the, all the scenes and I was in every one of them. The other actors over there was like, so I'm, I'm off uh, Wednesday, you want to go to the spa? It's like, no, I'm, I'm working from 8 till 7 every fucking day. Yeah. But the others had a lot of fun out there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I feel privileged to be able to play this character, so I'm happy. Yeah. But, but, um, but then for the last three days, we, do, we could just shoot. Mm -hmm. And they had, they had seen all the rehearsals, so they exactly knew that. So the camera's going to move like this instead of this. Mm -hmm. and, we, yeah. and, and we are covered in the 3D because we can just turn the cameras around and you, there was so much they could do. Yeah. And that is, that is a gift as an actor because you don't have to play the scene 25 times. And yeah. then we turn around, we turn around, yeah, we got it now. Yeah. It's like if you do a really good scene, yeah. it's like we have it. Yeah. Because we had two cameras on her and two on you and we have all of this as well. Mm -hmm. And it was a brilliant take, yeah. um, you know? So we don't need to do that anymore. Yeah. Um, 
And I, and I remember we did, we did like a scene, me and a, a very lovely actor called uh, Carlo Rhoda. And it was supposed to, we were supposed to shoot it the next day, but we were just ahead. You're never ahead when you're filming, but you are sometimes <laughs> in motion capture. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, can we just do that scene? So we, we, we weren't fully, fully rehearsed. It's like, mm. yeah, sit down, do it, like a fire, fireplace scene, just a casual chat that turns into something important. And we just kind of threw that away, did it. And it's become like the best, uh, people are saying this is the best motion capture scene in all Assassin's Creed games. Okay. Like, we just kind of pulled that out, you know? Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, because for me, and, and, and I can only talk about my experience, but for me, acting in, in gaming is like acting on film. Mm -hmm. you have to, it has to be real, it has to be the same. You, you don't have to talk loud, you don't have to, it's just, because it will capture everything, and if, you, if you're false, the camera will get that as well. Yeah. Even if they animate it, they can still, oh, there's something wrong here. And when you do an ADR, for example, to something that is wrong, you can also, f oh, it's not good, you know. Yeah. It's, so, so it's, for me, it's, it's just been like landing in that, it's the same. We shouldn't film. It's, it's the, that's it. Yeah. 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 Um, I think, let me see if there are any audience questions. We don't have one. Um, I want to ask you one last question, and then I think we, we've got the sign that we need to wrap up. Um, what, did you get a chance to do any of the um, the like in-game stuff? So that's that's one of the, the things that's very unique about acting for motion capture is um, you have all the work in the cinematic and you have the, the sort of traditional acting stuff, but then you also have these these uh, scenes where you or the shoots where you have to do like the character turns around, the character bends down to pick up a thing. Was that you doing those or was I it? I did some of it. Okay, um, but I I, rem I remember coming in there cocky going. I can do my own stunts. I've yeah. been doing all my own stunts in the in the series, unless yeah. that there was some writing I, w I wasn't allowed to do. But then they, they I remember they yeah, come in here. So this is uh, and he he pl plays you. Uh, he's the stunt, uh, and, he's, and you know, he had to do some some jumping. You know, <laughs> like yeah. uh, no, it's fine. He can just um, that's cool. Yeah, you know, just take, take yeah, you know, it's just like he's a stunt guy. That's cool. So so I. I do, I do, I, I did a lot of grabbing stuff and, but, but there's some running yeah. that I'm not doing okay. and there's some, obviously a lot of stage fight um, because they just pulled in a group of stunt guys doing yeah. all the, the fighting with no helmets on anyway because yeah, yeah. they would just fuck them up. Yeah. So I was, I was there and I did the helmet stuff afterwards going, yeah. <coughs> you know, yeah. um, but easier that the, the guys that have been rehearsing this fight for three days and are physically fitter than <laughs> us actors just going, oh, so you're going to animate me? Yeah. I can yeah. eat yeah. This, yeah. This, this year, you know? <laughs> um, so, so there's some of it I did, Sm small fight scenes where there yeah. was also um, uh, uh, dialogue, mm -hmm. but otherwise they came in and did it. Okay. Instead of me trashing the cameras. Yeah. <laughs> Good. We, we have, have one, one um, last, we'll, we'll get, get a short answer, answer to this one uh, um, audience, audience question, question, which is, is how do you keep your voice in good shape and the d d sort of deal with the technical vocal demands of acting for games? I think they're talking about a lot of the like, ah, kind of oh, yeah, stuff. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, I, I always do like 10 minutes warm up for my voice. Um, I, I was trained at the the um, drama school in Odense, mm -hmm. um, and I had this teacher there that gave, gave us all this program. <clears throat> so I do this every day I'm working. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing stage work, if I'm doing television, um, if I'm doing, you know, stuff. Um, so 10 minutes of voice warm up, and, and then I, <laughs> I, I had like, what, I, what, is, what are they called? Uh, woolen uh, underwear, like long. I use that from October. Okay. okay. And I, I take care of my neck. I have yeah. like a buff. Uh, I, uh, I long before other people, because this is, the, <clears throat> this is where the money is. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and if I fuck that, that up, I can't go in and do four hours of uh, voiceovers, yeah. which was what I did for this. And, and I've done, we talked about that uh, prior, but I've done, I think 13,000 lines in this game. And we're not done yet, but yeah. 13,000 lines. And that's without the, all the retakes and all the, it's just poof. Yeah. And 
being able to do that every day, mm. you need you need to be safe. I can't go out watching uh, Denmark play and then just go <laughs> shout and then go into the booth the next day. <clears throat> I don't have one of those, you know, heavy metal rock and roll voices that yeah. can just oh, I'm gonna scream all the time. You know, yeah. I can, I can, I can do that. Uh, I, I I need to proportion myself in that. And then we we did. Um, I think we did the first three hours. We jumped. Uh, we skipped all the all the shouting, all the war yeah, cries, yeah, yeah. and then in the last half hour, we didn't. We could just go back to the gameplay where you charge in and you say that and that and that, and where you kill him off and where you tr threaten that guy. Mm. We did all that yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> instead of ruining the voice in the first hour and then yeah. going, oh, this this very uh, sweet romance you're having here, you sound a little rough. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's because. Uh, you know that didn't work, yeah, um, totally. but I think it's different. It, it it differs for actor to actor. I know Cecilia did three hours. That was enough for her. Okay. Yeah. Um, because also your mind, your head. Yeah. After you, if you just st stand in the booth for four hours, yeah. four hours. The last hour, I I start mispronouncing stuff and just yeah. going, oh, where am I? Who are the? You know. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> also the voice is getting deeper. But also getting more, uh, you know, hoarse. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I hope that was a good answer to your question. I think. <laughs> cool. I think we're gonna um, wrap it up there and say thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank, thank you for, for having, having this seminar. seminar because yeah. It's, it's so important. Yeah. And I didn't know that uh, two years ago, but now yeah. I know it's, this is just this is the shit, man. You're doing yeah. so fucking cool, man. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. And um, I'd, I'd like, like to say uh, thank you very much to our guests, guests everyone who's been, who's been with us today. Thank, thank you very much to you at home, the audience, for joining us and being, being a part of this. Um, and then on behalf of the Danish National School of Performing Arts, I would also like to say thank you to our technicians, Jeppe Levetz and Jim Falk, for running the program today, as well as to uh, our helpers, Laura kamers -Lang and uh, Trine Jensen, who have been moderating the comments and uh, uh, taking care of the chat room. So yeah, thank you to everyone. And thank you so much, Alex, for hosting the day. It's mm -hmm. been fantastic. Mm -hmm. I guess that's it for today, right? Yeah. Thank you for joining. See you next time. <laughs>